Welcome to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. I am your host, Molly Southgate, and today I'm interviewing Erin Hoover. Hi there. How are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing good, Molly. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm really excited to be chatting with you and get to talk about some poetry. So can you tell me about your writing? So the poetry I write is narrative. It's all personal and in some ways related to things that have happened to me in my life. However, there is an element of fiction or um, kind of looking at it and and shaping a narrative out of it. Um, The other thing I try to do is, you know, put the things that happen in a larger social context. Um, So the book that I have coming out, No Spare People, it was written primarily from 2018 um, to 2021. So there are things in there that that I think reflect maybe the mood of that time, um, not only for me, but things I was observing in the larger culture. Um, so it's so personal, cool. but it's also, you know, broader. Yeah, like, yeah, can you talk a little bit more about broadening that and kind of having the, the more fictional elements? Is it is it almost like self-mythology? Self-mythology. Oh, that's a that's a really interesting way to put it. Um, I can talk about one of the poems I wrote, um, which is a, a long prose poem, and, and it has to do with um, my experience of going through the coronavirus as a single parent of a, a young child, uh, feeling so much pressure. And I think at that time, me personally, my mind was going back to September 11th and when I lived in New York during that time. Um, it was weird the way the two traumas were kind of resonating off of each other. And so I ended up writing and kind of writing about both of those times through this poem. Um, So there's ways that, um, you know, the person in the present day, the speaker, could be talking about things that happened before. Um, A lot of the poems are very meditative in that they're thinking through issues of ethics or thinking through, um, you know, what it what is motherhood, (laughs) Essentially, I became a mom um, right before I started writing this book. So, so a lot of that is in there too. But um, yeah, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that that even though it may be a little self mythologizing, that it may touch on ways that other people also self mythologize. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's fantastic! How did you how did you get into writing poetry and kind of writing for the the more meditative aspects, like working through things through writing? Yeah, um, I think that as a young person, I I tried a a number of different things. I thought at one point I wanted to be a painter, even. I really liked the visual arts. I liked photography. I've always been like a big arts person. But but anyway, when I when I first started writing poetry, which was for a school assignment, um, I had never really experienced with such clarity the way arrangements of language and really attention to language could help, could really help me um, think through things that were bothering me or ideas that were in conflict. So the first poems I wrote were actually about uh, the death of a family member, um, because that's what I was struggling with at that time. And somehow poetry was able to, to get me to to see what I needed to see in that. Um, So I kept writing it. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I think that that is something so amazing about poetry is that it's, it kind of like comes to you when you need it, for sure. Yeah, I, th- yeah, I think there's a reason why we read poems at weddings and funerals and graduation. And, you know, there, there's something about poetry where it's always held this, this role in our culture um, to, to memorialize or to commemorate or also to imagine. Yeah, so that's, so that's like on the act of, Act of reading it, but what does writing it mean to you? Writing something to memorialize, commemorate all those things that you just listed. That's a really that's a really good question. Um, I guess, gosh, I don't want to sound like a megalomaniac, but it makes me feel a little bit powerful, right? Because here I am, kind of pulling various ideas from history, from my surroundings, from the culture, and shaping something creative out of that. Um, so there's there's some of some of that's coming from external to me, but some of it's also from me and the way I see things um, or the way I'm perceiving and putting things together. Um, you know, I think I think writing right this goes with writing fiction and nonfiction too. It's just a tremendous kind of power that the author has. Um, 
And I know that when I'm reading, I'm kind of going along with the author that that I'm reading and thinking along with them. So it's also this this um, opportunity for empathy and connecting with others. I guess that's what I think about when I'm writing um, in terms of what I what I hope I'm doing. I love that. Yeah, I I think I mean at least for me when I'm reading poetry that that really that that sense of empathy that's a that's a good word for it. It really comes across for sure. Um, I I want to talk a bit about perspective in poetry though. Um, what, how do you use perspective in your writing? Like perspective, like who is speaking in the poem? Who is speaking or or what, what the person thinks on it? Cause is it, is it always you or is it someone else or where? Oh yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I guess I think. I think that for writers, um, I think poets pay attention to this, but I think, but I think fiction writers do too. It's, it's like you're writing a version of someone, you know, when a fiction writer writes a character, they're writing a version that, that in some ways accessible to them, even though it's not them. Whereas I think for me writing poetry, often first person, I'm writing some version of me that existed at a certain point in time in an event that I'm writing about but there's no way to encompass like the fullness of a person. Um, So in some ways, that's another way that like the intent of the author can come in or the intent of the poet. Oh, totally. Yeah. Do you have any, do you have any recommendations actually for poetry books or for just books in general for writers or anyone looking to get into it? Oh my goodness. Um, You know, this question, it's always like, it depends which day. Yeah, oh, I get that. <laughs> but I did, I you know, I did want to talk about a few books that that I really have read lately that that I enjoyed a lot, and and part of this goes to what I what I go to poetry for too. Um, that that way of of gaining access to another viewpoint when you're reading poetry and really coming along with the poet. Um, um, there is this poet Destiny Hemphill who wrote a book called Mother World, a devotional for the altar life. Um, that's so, I learned so much from this book. Um, it is about the experience of, of, you know, being black in the South and the history of kind of racism in the South, but also like how to, how to move through that and how to build the kind of world you want to live in. And so Hemphill is writing that, you know, that's not an experience that I personally would have. But she does talk about ways of knowing. She does talk about um, ways of of aspiring to both hear hear the dreams of your ancestors, but also you know the kind of the kind of place and person you want to be. And and so you know I like that. I like the way she creates that space. Um, so I re- I really recommend that book. Um, the other book that I would recommend is um, Jamie Ringlob has written a book called So Tall It Ends in Heaven. So both of these books came out recently. Hemphill's came came out this year and, and uh, Ringlib's came out last year. And he uses form to subvert the love poem, um, which I'm like, okay, <laughs> Let, let's do that. Um, uh, Jamie's book, Jamie is a friend of mine actually. And his book is um, maybe rethinking love. If love specifically queer love has always been grounded in shame for you. How do you, how do you break out of that? And how do you think about love in a different way? Oh, that sounds amazing. So both. Yeah. So these are, these are books that I recommend to readers in that, that they are, they are very accessible. So it's, you know, you don't need your like poetic theory book with you to read them. Um, They're very kind of like heartfelt and um, thoughtful. Um, but they're books that I learned a lot from as a, as a poet who's, who's written for a long time. And I, I think, I think both books are really excellent. So I recommend that Jamie, R- Jamie Ringlib's So Tall It Ends in Heaven and Destiny Hemphill's Mother World, A Devotional for the Altar Life. Those both sound incredible. I'm, I'm so going to check those out <laughs> right after this interview. Thank you. Um, so you also teach, right? Has that- I sure do. Has that impacted your writing in any way? And what what's that experience been like for you? So I, I'm an assistant professor at Tennessee Tech University in Cookville, Tennessee. And um, 
I teach creative writing here. Um, I teach poetry, uh, um, editing, a, a, n- a number of topics. But in terms of teaching poetry, I think I think that when you are teaching something and explaining something and in conversation with other people, there's no way to do that without doing some rethinking of what you're talking about Um, in terms of, you know, when I, every time I do a lesson on meter, you know, or music and sound and poetry, I kind of re-internalize all of that information. And then students will ask questions that are totally brilliant. So, you know, for me, I, I learn a lot in, in the classroom too. Um, And, you know, I, I said the other day to someone, you know, if, if I hadn't become a professor who teaches poetry, I would just be someone in an office talking to her, the person in the other cubicle about poetry. So, so it's probably I, best I'm I love here. That so much. That's so yeah. you, you found you found your place. That is I awesome. did. Yeah. Actually, okay, wait, you just said something that made me made me want to ask more about music and sound in poetry. Can you speak on that a little bit and how you use that in your own writing? Yes. Um, so I think that every poet probably has a different kind of vantage on this. And yet I also think that our practices might be similar in that whenever you're writing and thinking about sound and meter and the way words kind of land in a poem, you're calling back to all the other poetry you've, you've ever read um, or all the, all the phrases in, in a good work of fiction or nonfiction that have, have stayed with you. Um, there's a way that we internalize speech rhythm um, and the way we kind of connect the sound of a word to what it means. All right, this, I mean, it's kind of theoretical, right? I don't have any proof for this. I'm but, right there with you already. I'm, I'm right here. <laughs> yeah, but the, but the more the more um, that I read, um, I think I think that gets into that gets into the work. So so just as an example of like when I'm writing a poem, um, I'm often thinking through some sort of story or some something that I'm trying to connect. Um, so I write all that down and then. Then I sort of revise in terms of how to how to bring out the patterning in the sounds or the meter. You know, where where do I want the reader to kind of stop and say, oh, this is this is an important thing or like, where do I want them to land in terms of almost like if you think about singing a song, there are always those words that like, at least if I'm in the car singing that I'm like singing extra loud. So (laughs) if I'm thinking of a reader at home, what words are extra loud in my poem, you know, Um, and and then you shape the poem around that. That's awesome. Yeah. And it, and it can be like, what, what do you want to stick out? But also it, there can be an interesting discovery in finding what does stick out Yeah, that you like unintentionally made an important point. You weren't even thinking that that would have been the central like thesis of the poem, but oh, totally. you yourself there. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, that process I just talked about of the, really the subconscious of, of taking all the things that you've read and honestly, all the things you've experienced, I mean, that comes out then in the poem and then me, the conscious poet, I'm like, let me, let me kind of like shape this into a work of art that someone else would want to participate in and read. Yeah. How much of your subconscious does take over when you're writing, especially when you're drawing on like things that have happened to you and your background? Um, yeah, I can speak to this because I think um, my composition process is not something where I sit down at a certain time of day and can schedule my writing. Um, well, I mean, I do do that, but where I get inspiration is usually just when I'm out and about living my life. Sometimes it's also like watching movies or doing research, you know, reading a news story or reading something online. And I'll just jot down a little note about it. And I have like a notebook where I keep all these. Um, so when I have, a few hours to write, I can return to those ideas, but they, they kind of bubble up naturally as I'm, as I'm just living my life. Yeah, um, I feel like that's, that can be, I, I always thought that that's what happened with a lot of, a lot of poets, but it, it's not always the most common, like some, I know a lot of people who like need it 
where it's super, super yeah. outlined and everything. So that's, that's everyone's cool. different for sure. Um, and I often, you know, I think to myself, will the, will the inspiration run out? Like what if things stop bubbling up? But part of that is like taking care of yourself, right? Not, not getting too kind of down that you can't write, um, being curious and always being open to um, like, I, I'm, I'm someone who I can talk to anybody. And one of the reasons I, I think I can talk to anybody just out and about in the world is, is I learn so much from people. Like that's where the ideas come from. So it's like, you know, feed me more ideas. <laughs> there's always, um, yeah, there's always more people in the world and always more, yeah, more stories to learn. So many things to research too. Um, yeah. I love YouTube for that reason, actually. <laughs> oh yeah. I, yeah. I was going to actually ask you what, what is a research process like for writing a poetry book? Um, yeah, so two two poems where I did that that I can I can talk about specifically is I have a long poem about the '90s, and I have to say I know the '90s are kind of trendy now. I was onto this several years ago. <laughs> uh, you you were the of... reason it was trendy, I think. <laughs> Trendsetter. Yes. Yes, VH1 copied me with all their 90s uh, documentaries. But I was thinking about um, the way our current political situation and some of the issues we were dealing with in America actually were seated, um, especially in the 90s, which was a decade that I lived through as a teenager. Um, I remember there were several kind of big news stories, a lot of things that happened then that were new. Uh, like school shootings um, in particular. There were also um, a, a lot of discussion of, of issues of race and gender inequality during that time. Um, it was the time period between uh, fall of the Berlin Wall and also September 11th. Anyway, I won't give a lesson on the 90s, but I wanted to put all I that. Was, I was down for it. I was like, I was enjoying <laughs> the history lesson. Yeah. So, so I, what I did is I wrote this poem where, where I didn't want to do like a Billy Joel, like who didn't start the fire. Like let's, let's list a bunch of stuff that happened in the nineties. So I tried to talk about different incidents in the nineties and then put a speaker who could be identified as me because as a teenage female speaker and what she was doing at that time. Um, and what I, what I emphasize in that is the kind of naive lack of involvement that speaker had, because I think, I mean, that's, that's true now too. We're all sort of going about our lives and yet there are all these kind of explosions of, of things happening around us. Um, so I, so I figured out how to order those. Um, I brought out at the end kind of the, the, the fact that, I mean, people look back at the nineties and think, Oh, what a peaceful time, but like, was it, <laughs> you know, like it wasn't. Um, so I wanted to point that out with that poem, but, but yeah, the internet research was totally fun. Um, I ended up wanting to use, uh, an image. I used to like bagel bites a lot when I was a teenager. Do you know what those are? Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> so I looked up all this stuff about bagel bites and I found out that meatloaf had actually sang it. There was like some commercial involving bagel bites. That, like anyway, so this, these Wait, are the rabbit holes I go down. Meatloaf about bagel bites? That's yeah. crazy. Huh. Yeah, that did that didn't end up in the poem, but the bagel bites did. Well, now um, I, I want to find this commercial. <laughs> I'm a curious, you know, when I say curious, <laughs> I will click on a link, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Listen yeah. to a meatloaf song. <laughs> um, another poem that I uh wrote based on research, it came from watching YouTube videos. Um I grew up in Pennsylvania where like I don't know. I mean, there there used to be all these department stores all over America. Um, and we would go, my family would go to them. I lived in the country, so it would always be a drive. And it was like a big, a big fun trip, right? Um, and my brother and I were watching YouTube videos. Uh, there's like all these series about going to abandoned places. Oh, yeah. A yeah. bunch of explorers going into these stores. We also watched a lot of videos about the history of some of the stores that we grew up with. Um, so, like, he sort of did this research with me. And I wrote a poem called Retail Requiem, which does a very similar thing to the other poem I just told you about, um, the one about the 90s. We have all of these retail stores collapsing. And then, who are the people working in the stores? People I knew. Who are the people shopping in the stores? Me and people I knew. 
So putting those things together in the form of a requiem, which is, you know, a prayer for the dead. That is, that is so beautiful. That's, that's <laughs> such a, such a cool idea. You know, the, the first thing that you're talking about saying that you're taking the, like the history events and then kind of juxtaposing it with this other like indifference going on. I, it reminded me of that, that like diary ent- entry that was found from the sixties that went like semi-famous. You heard of what? this? Word? I don't know it's, about this. It's like two lines and I can't remember for the life of me what the first line is, but it was something like, oh, I went out today and I had school and uh, I got detention and this teacher sucks. By the way, man landed on the moon and then it just <laughs> ends. And it's, it's so perfect, like encapsulating that feeling of like this complete nonchalance with this major event that happened. Meanwhile, yeah. all of these like little things get all of this space. Yeah. And we, we don't, we also don't remember things that happen. Like mm-hmm. um, I think, I think about, like I told you that COVID kind of dredged up all these September 11th memories for me. Um, but I, then I start, I, I was like, are these real? Are these my memories? Are these, are these things that have come to me through the way that has been mythologized? Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, that when I talk about like, you know, really thinking about how Destiny Hemphill is is thinking through ways of knowing and understanding the world around you. I think Jamie Renglob is thinking about how to understand yourself and and what you want. I mean, those are themes that I'm doing too in my book in in No Spare People. Yeah, about your book. At what point during this writing process did you know that it would become a book? Um yeah, so this book, this book is weird. Um, I wouldn't say if any other poets are listening to this, don't don't get mad at me. Um, what happened was <laughs> it's all about breaking the rules. It's all about <laughs> well, I had a kid, okay. Um, and then I was like, oh, I I want to I had flood of ideas, so many things I wanted to write about. And yet, you know, when you have a very young child, it's very hard to find the time to do that. Um when you have the time, you don't have the energy. So anyway, I, I, I sort of was this little bank of ideas. You know, I had written some of them down, but I think some of them were stored or some of the feelings I was having were, were just like sort of locked in me or stored in me. Um, and then I was lucky enough to ha- get to go to a writing retreat. Um, there is a place in Arkansas called the Writer's Colony uh, at Derry Hollow. And I was able to go and stay there uh, while my parents watched my daughter. I had a two week residency and I wrote most of the book in, in those two weeks. Oh, wow. That sounds amazing. Um, I wrote several poems a day. Um, and, and so then after that, you look at all, I looked at all the things I had written and I thought, okay, so, so does, how does this cohere? Like, like I, I was I didn't have an agenda going in, right. I just wanted to write poems. Uh, but once I had written them, I thought, okay, does this have a theme? Does, how do these match up? And, and so I put it together into kind of a proto book, um, sat with it for a bit and then wrote some other poems to fill in places that, that I thought needed to be filled in. That's a Um, really interesting, that's a really interesting process with it. Like I said, it's, it's weird. (laughs) I mean, maybe not the, maybe not having a proto manuscript and then filling in that may be more normal, but, but, um, being able to generate a lot of work really quickly and kind of a flash. I don't know how common that is. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to do. That's a, that's a big deal. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I hadn't written in like three years, so it was like a, you know, for a writer to not write for three years is like, you're suffering. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> well, um, so what, how, how did that compare to your first book? The process with that? Oh yeah. See, that was so different because those were poems that, uh, Barnburner is my first book. And those were poems that I was writing roughly from 2013 through 2017. So another kind of like four year period. Um, I was in graduate school, so there was a regular process for producing poems. Of course, I wrote many poems that are not in the book. Um, but I also had the mentorship and guidance of my, my professor's that were at Florida State, which was where I did my my um, PhD. Um, so that was more maybe more of a normal process because it was very like structured. 
Um, you know, I, I created a manuscript. I showed it to a dissertation director. She gave me feedback. Uh, I worked on it a bit. Um, I defended it. And then I, I started sending it out. So that's, you know, that's the basic way to do it. <laughs> it's one way to do it. Uh, the other way, the kind of more, more uh, you know, unusual write everything in two weeks way is that that's the way I did the second book. Yeah, that's really cool. So now that you're on your second book, do you find that you have any like motifs or phrases or even just singular words that you tend to use and tend to gravitate towards? Um, well, I think, I think because this book, um, No Spare People is so much about um, motherhood. I mean, by the way, the, the title No Spare People comes from the fact that my daughter and I are just a two person family. Mm -hmm. um, the book also then touches on the fact that there are no spare people, that everybody, everybody matters. I mean, the concept itself is, is a false concept, right? Um, but anyway, so, so those, uh, a lot of them are images and things drawn from, from my life during this period of time, uh, which means that often they're very domestic images, um, things pulled from like buildings where I worked, <laughs> you know, landscapes where I walked through. Um, and a lot of it again was, was research, I guess. Um, but, but I think, I think we're, you know, if you were to look at the book with, with this in mind, you'd be, you'd be struck by the, the commonplaceness of it. Um, the way I'm trying to kind of like make us see things that we, that are always around us. Um, cause that's, I mean, that's what I'm trying to do as a living person, <laughs> you know, uh, not just walk through the world blindly, but, but, um, but see, see the beauty in it and see, see the meaning in it. I love that. And that's, that's something that's so, so beautiful about poetry and writing is that, that ability to make the, make the mundane like magic and have that mm -hmm. like really brought to life for people. Cause a lot, I feel like a lot of people associate with poetry with being like these big grand sweeping images. And when you're, you're actually reading it, they feel like that. But it is things like our day-to-day -day jobs and yeah. taking walks and everything that translates into the other world. Yeah. The last poem in the book is called What If Pain No Longer Ordered the Narrative? Mm -hmm. And um, it's about having breakfast with my daughter. So she's pushing syrup around her plate. Um, I remember she had really thin hair at that point because she was a little baby. So I talk, talk about that. Well, she wasn't a baby, but like a little kid. I talk mm -hmm. about the clatter of the restaurant, you know, so any thoughts that the speaker is having are always taking place in this background of, of just, you know, being with my kid, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. That is so cool. Well, thank you so much for coming on today. This has been so amazing to talk to you. I just have. You ask great questions. questions. Molly. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You've had amazing answers. This has been <laughs> awesome. Um, my last one is just, what do you have coming up? Oh, yeah. So um, when No Spare People comes out in late October, I'm going to be going on a small book tour. Um, as a single parent, it's hard for me to go on a much longer book tour. And of course, I think probably most authors would tell you those don't really exist so much anymore. Um, but I've set up some readings in Tennessee. I'll be at the Louisville Book Festival. Um, I'll be reading in New York and Philadelphia um, and a few places in other places in Pennsylvania. Um, and so, so yeah, I hope um, folks will check my website, erinhooverpoet.com and, and, you know, see where I am and come see me in the months of October and November, 2023. Yes, absolutely. I wish... I wish I was able to, I was, I wish I was able to go. I live too far away, unfortunately, but that sounds so amazing. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for coming on again for read between the lines. My name is Molly Southgate. I'm Aaron Hoover. Let's end this the way all great stories end happily ever after the, the end. end. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. You can find the show on Instagram and Facebook at Read Between the Lines Podcast. Make sure to follow the authors I've been talking to to hear about their upcoming projects. Their links are in the show notes. 
This show is hosted by me, Molly Southgate, and produced and edited by Rob Southgate. Read Between the Lines is a Southgate Media Group production, and you can find all of the great content from the network at www.southgatemediagroup.com. If you want to read about how I and many other podcasters got started, you can read the stories in the nonfiction anthology Pod Life. The link to that book and the books you heard about today are in the episode's show notes. One more thing. Please rate and review Read Between the Lines wherever you listen to this podcast. It helps others find this show, which helps me attract more authors. Thanks so much. Until next time, keep reading.